Well, new developments out of Iran today, which has reportedly threatened to preempt a European Union oil embargo by cutting off its own fuel exports to the region. Iran has also proclaimed major advances in its nuclear pro program today, a development that's not likely to sit well with the West, which suspects that program of being aimed at producing atomic weapons. Now, the significance of these developments lies partly in the timing. Iran has reiterated its readiness to resume talks with major powers in, in order to discuss controvers its controversial nuclear program, but that message seems to have been drowned out by the drumbeat of war, or at least aggressive talk, out of Israel. Now, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has accused Iran of trying to destabilize the world, alleging that Tehran was behind the recent bombings in Georgia, India, and Thailand. Iran, in turn, says that Israel is waging a psychological war that many fear may pave the way to military action. Now, a lot of tough talk here, but if it turned to action, the big question is where that would leave the U.S. It's a little bit too much of a familiar scenario here but that reminds me a little bit, to be frank, with uh, Iraq. The threat of uh, weapons of mass destruction, Al-Qaeda in Iran, uh, pundits and lawmakers warning that the time is to act right now or else. And it seems that the U.S. public opinion potentially is swaying too. A recent poll by the newspaper The Hill found that nearly half of all likely voters believe that the U.S. should be willing to use military force in order to prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And while President Obama has called for a diplomatic resolution, he has been just as clear that no option is off the table. So the drumbeat of war is growing louder. The question is where that march will lead. Well, for that, let's turn to investigative journalist and historian Gareth Porter, who is with us in our studios here. Gareth, thank you. Um, before we sort of get into uh, you know, the, the nuances in, in the U.S. administration's policy towards the issue, try to help me sort of dig through the rhetoric here. Because everyone, each side, Israel, the Iranians, the Americans, uh, are sort of playing this game of bluffing, of uh, you know, talking tough. There is a lot of that going on, no question about it. I mean, the Iranian move to threaten to cut off exports of crude oil to European countries, not the first time they've done it. And of course, it's the logical for, thing for them to do, because uh, it is a bargaining tool for them to try to get Greece, Spain, and uh, uh, Italy, particularly the three major European countries which do import large amounts of oil from, uh, from Iran, to pull back and say, well, maybe we can figure out a way to avoid a cutoff of our, uh, an ending of our uh, dealings so with those Iran. They're struggling economically. They're struggling economically, and this gives Iran an obvious bargaining chip, which the, the Iranians are the, the ones who are going to always play. They're bargaining chips. They are the world's greatest bargainers. It's not for nothing that we talk about Persian rugs. They're the original Persian rug salesman. And they always want to hold off or, or hold on to mm -hmm. the bargaining chips until they can play them when the timing is right. And I think they now feel this is the time to do it. Mm -hmm. So then what accounts for, for example, for Israel's rhetoric? Clearly, uh, the Israelis are, you know, have geopolitical strategic interest for not seeing a nuclear-armed Iran, but it does seem like the talk has been amped up massively in the past few months. Well, there are two different levels of this. At one level, there's no doubt the Israelis, particularly uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, are playing the, the threat of a war against Iran for everything it's worth to try to put pressure on Iran, to put pressure on the United States, mm -hmm. perhaps even more than, than Iran, to do something more drastic, more uh, fundamental against Iran. Of course, what they really want is for the United States to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. But behind that, there is a very serious question as to whether Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu has himself personally a kind of Masada complex, as some Jewish friends call it, mm -hmm. um, or, or a messianic complex about the, being the, the savior of the Jewish people, and thus being willing to risk really the end of the state of Israel. So there's a serious question about that. And I, I don't know the answer, but, but it does, in fact, demand very careful attention to, to his role in this. But yet the timeline of all this uh, came from the U.S. It was Panetta who leaked or, or sort of said that uh, he's, he's expecting the Israelis may have Yeah, and I, I, I viewed that as another ploy, another bargaining uh, tactic, if you will, to try to put pressure on Iran to say, look, uh, it's a good cop, bad cop routine. At the same time, I do think that the Obama administration is very concerned about the Israeli policy that they want to distance the United States from any threat of war by Israel against Iran. And, and should the Israelis make that decision, uh, 
it's not clear what Obama would do, whether he would come to Israel's assistance or not. He's been making very quiet, very subtle signals uh, to both Israel and Iran that the United States would stay out of a war if the United States bases and, and forces were not attacked. Mm -hmm. But let me just step back for a moment and <laughs> bring to bear a, a little bit of historical perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, in this situation where everyone is very excited, the U.S. news media uh, sort of hyperventilating over every new uh, charge against Iran and every new statement that Iran makes about its nuclear program, it's uh, wise, I think, to just remember only a few years ago, 2006, when the Iranians were actually talking to the European three, the U.K., Germany, and France, sitting down to negotiate, the Iranians were actually offering to limit the number of centrifuges to 3,000 or less. Mm -hmm. That is a deal that if, if the United States and the Europeans would have uh, leapt at it, would have avoided this kind of crisis. At that point, the United States was not willing to support the deal and it was not willing to give that element that the Iranians demanded, which was a security guarantee. The Europeans wanted it, the Bush administration refused. And how can you have any serious talks with Iran without really talking about a security guarantee? That is of the essence of the deal that has to be made. Right. Well, I mean, you know, you, you talked about sort of the rhetoric coming out of the mainstream media and even from our own politicians. And uh, the assumption is, or, or, or the portrayal of the Iranians is always as these, you know, irrational actors, this terrifying threat. And yet uh, we haven't really seen, at least not in recent history, the Iranians acting out no, irrationally. No, I mean, that, of course, is a complete uh, caricature and uh, hardly even... Uh, a caricature worth uh, paying any attention to because the, ma the matter of fact is that the Iranians are very careful calculators. They're very clever negotiators. They carefully consider the balance of forces and, and what their assets are and what the, the uh, adversary's assets are. Uh, I, I think they are the exact opposite of the caricature that we're hearing, from, particularly, of course, from the Israelis, but also from uh, from the United States to a great extent. And yet the Israelis, for instance, the Israelis have uh, attacked uh, unprovoked. Uh, mm -hmm. We saw the bombings a few years ago. The Israelis, uh, uh, of course, have not uh, admitted to having the nuclear program, but have also not signed on to any sort of international well, agreements. Well, as, as a student of international politics, I have to point out mm -hmm. that the contrast between Israel and, and Iran militarily is really quite profound. The Israelis have very great offensive capabilities. The Iranians have nothing. Mm -hmm. They have no offensive capabilities at all. All they have is the ability to retaliate, both through assets in other countries, their allies, Shia in particular allies in the Middle East, and through, you know, uh, retaliation through, through missiles uh, against Israel and against U.S. Uh, bases in the region. So really they are a defensive power by definition, by the very um, nature of their military assets and, and the lack of assets. So in that light, since you say uh, in your piece you sort of talked about uh, the U.S. seems to be hinting that it would only get pulled into a conflict if its own soldiers or its own ships or its own bases were attacked, could we see perhaps since there's so much brinkmanship here um, an attack that was done perhaps by somebody else in order to pull the U.S. into that conflict? Well, that of, that, course, that, that of course is always uh, a danger, that there could be a false flag attack or an effort at, at least at a false flag attack. But I can tell you that both the Iranians and the Americans are going to be very, very alert for anything of the sort. And it would have to be done very, very well in order to pass uh, the test of uh, scrutiny by both countries. Right, and very briefly, I mean, we, you know, we, we, we've seen everyone sort of throwing around this uh, drumbeat to, to war, myself included. Uh, what would be the consequences, even of a quick uh, U.S. military intervention attack in Iran? I mean, it, it seems like there'd be Well, it's not going to be from the United States. I mean, I can guarantee you with almost certainty that the United States is not going to take the initiative to attack Iran. The question is, what would happen if Israel attacked? And what I'm hearing is that the U.S. military is very determined that the U.S. response immediately should be to call for a ceasefire, mm -hmm. not to intervene, not to uh, start their own war against Iran, but to call for a ceasefire. And I think that's quite credible. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there, but quite interesting uh, discussion, especially in light of all of this, again, amped up rhetoric wherever you turn. So thank you very much for shedding some uh, balanced light on this issue. And that was Gareth Porter, investigative journalist and historian.